Father Laurence with Irish and English roots. Father Laurence Freeman was educated by the Benedictines and studied English literature at New College, Oxford University. Before entering monastic life, he worked with the United Nations in New York in banking and in journalism. He is director of the World Community for Christian Meditation, a global, inclusive, contemplative community. Father Laurence is a monk of a Benedictine congregation of Monte Oliveto Maggiore. John Main was his teacher, and Father Laurence assisted him in establishing the foundations of community. Father Laurence is the author of a number of books on Christian meditation. He travels extensively, giving presentations and leading Christian meditation retreats. <clears throat> so over to you, Father Laurence. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Georgie. And uh, thank you to the Laszlo Institute and to the very enriching contributions of the, of the speakers. Unfortunately, today um, I'm in Bonveau, which is my, my home um, our international center in France and um, taking part in a retreat. So I've only been able to dip in uh, to some of, some of the wonderful moments uh, so far. Um, and I'd like to say a special uh, thank you to Chloe. I don't think she will remember, but uh, many years ago, uh, do you do remember? Good. We, we, she, she contributed her great gift uh, to a seminar with His Holiness the Dalai Lama called The Good Heart, um, in which he was commenting very bravely and very wisely on, uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the Gospels, on the Christian scriptures. And um, I remember Chloe made a very wonderful contribution to all of those sessions before each session. So nice to see you again. So, um, I think this question of, uh, of uh, sentience and consciousness and what Irvin said at the beginning about the universe itself being both sentient and conscious is one, it sounds a very abstract metaphysical kind of question, but it's one of those redemptive questions for our time. And if we can find the right questions, the right redemptive questions, then we find our way through uh, to the truth and to the, uh, to the resolution of some of the confusion and the anguish that we are going through at this period of our evolution. I think it's important for us to be able to get the questions right so that we can see that what we are passing through in this period of our history is a dark night of the soul, rather than just unleashing chaos and just self-destructiveness, which are aspects of it. But a dark night of the soul, as St. John of the Cross calls it, is truly a dark night and involves a great deal of suffering, but is also ultimately purposeful. It ultimately leads to a new point of evolution which we cannot see because we can't see around corners. But I think asking the right question and this question about consciousness takes us, I think, into a, a, an engagement with the meaning of what the world is going through at this moment. So I'd like to, to thank the Institute for, for raising this, this question because it points us also from the dualistic to the unified consciousness. I don't think we should be too hard on dualism because that's where we are. That's what we're doing. And there is a purpose there are in, in dualism. It leads us to consciousness in part because of the suffering and the confusion that it causes us to be in a dualistic state. It's not comfortable, but it can also, as suffering does, awaken us and alert us to the, to the, the deeper meaning of the journey that we are on with the universe, with each other. So 
uh, duality has a purpose. Julian of Norwich, the great English mystic of the 14th century has a very wonderful expression, sin is behoovely, sin is necessary. And most of what we call sin, if we think of sin as something more than just the breaking of rules or conventions, but if we think of sin as that state of division and duality, which causes the worst in human nature, God knows that's what we're seeing in Ukraine at the moment, um, if we can see that it has a, a purpose, it has a, a, a behoveliness, as Julian calls it, I think it's easier for us to cope with the challenge and the opportunity to overcome duality, to work for peace. And that's a choice. Are we on the side of duality? Or are we on the side of the, of, the, of the reconciliation process, which is really what evolution, I, I, as I understand it, is about? But we need to identify those dualities. And to see, we need a certain detachment from our experience, this, the detachment that meditation gives us the detachment that we find at the heart of all the great spiritual wisdom traditions. The detachment, which is not cold scientific objectivity, but the detachment which is the, creates the space for compassion and creates, releases the energy of love. Another wonderful, insight of Julian of Norwich was when she looked around the world and she said, what is this mess that we are in? This was in the 14th century. Uh, what is the meaning of it all? Is there a meaning to it? And her conclusion was in one word, love. Love is the source. Out of love, everything that exists comes into being, the great philosophical wonder that anything exists at all, that it emerges out of love. It is sustained in its movement and its evolution by love. And the meaning, the ultimate meaning is love. As we consider all the dualities which cause us such suffering, it's important that we have a vision of the whole and, and uh, a way of making meaning as we are in process, as we are on our journey. So we're filled, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're full of uh, dualities, human and divine. In the Christian tradition, this is, this is, this is focused, of course, in the person of, 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 of Jesus, the human and the, the divine. What could be more of a duality than that, or could be more of an opposite than that. And yet, in the Christian vision, there is an integration there, or of matter and spirit, or of male and female, of cultures, of races. And from the Christian mystical tradition, there is a, there's been a long, history of wrestling with this question of dualities. And it's, it's, it's a history that's been enriched by dialogue with other, with other wisdom traditions, of course. And it led to this very simple but profound and statement, God is the reconciliation of opposites. God does not take sides. We cannot claim God to be on my side of this war or on that side of that war. God is the reconciliation of opposites. And all of this takes place in the human, in human consciousness. What the significance of this work of reconciliation of opposites 
as it happens within the human. What the meaning of that is for the universe is a big question beyond our ordinary understanding. But we do seem to be important in the meaning of the universe. And it is our struggle to reconcile opposites in ourselves, because it's not done abstractly and it's not just done in the head is it it's done in our lives in the few decades we have each of us to live and to pass on within tradition within community uh, whatever we have learned so we we hunger and thirst for that condition of reconciliation. And it's a good word because it doesn't mean that the, all of the aspects of the dualistic are deleted, that everything becomes some uh, amorphous uh, uniformity. But in that reconciliation of opposites, everything that is precious, beautiful, moving, everything that has value is given its due recognition and appreciation. So we hunger and thirst for that. We don't want to lose anything that is good in this process of reconciliation. And that's perhaps what integration, individuation, uh, psychologically and, and in other ways, socially, sociologically, this is what makes it difficult because we don't want to lose anything precious, but making sure that everything becomes integrated. That is, that is the work and the vocation, I would say, of, of the human and that we do this within our own humanity and within a common humanity, not just an atomized uh, individualistic humanity. So we hunger and thirst for this. And as St. Augustine said, our heart is restless until it finds its rest in God. But remember what God is. God is this reconciliation of opposite in which nothing is lost or wasted. Even the most terrible things. I was in Ukraine a few, a uh, couple of weeks ago and uh, visiting our community there that teaches meditation. And I was in a relatively safe part of the country, but felt very conscious speaking to the refugees, speaking to the people who are caring for them, our communities involved in that, uh, of, of the horror of what is happening there, the breakdown of the human and the craziness, the stupidity of polarization and of dualism run rampant. And as when we left Ukraine, we um, drove back into Poland and we actually we had a puncture in our car, so we were forced to stop in this little town. And uh, it turned out to be a town where there had been a concentration camp. So we spent an hour there, conscious of that other memory of the horror of what happens to the human when it loses this connection with its purpose and its meaning. Duality itself then I would say is not a problem. And unless it descends into polarization until we take sides so insanely so one-sidedly that we, that we lose the, the detachment necessary for clear thinking and right action and for compassion. What is it that brings about this reconciliation? 
First of all, it's the simple act of attention. When we are able to consider, to take the time necessary to give our attention to a question, to a situation, to a person in need, to the refugees, and, and not send, as the British government is doing at the moment, sending the refugees to Rwanda to get rid of them, but that we give true attention, love, and attention is love. We give our attention to what we love, and we love what we give our attention to. Attention is redemptive, it is healing and integrating, and it brings about this reconciliation, pure attention. That attention may at times, of course, be focused particularly on providing food and shelter and clothing and toys for the children of refugees. But the essence of attention is this power of the human, of human consciousness to see and look beyond itself, beyond my own personal needs and problems and difficulties and ambitions and desires and fantasies, to look beyond that with an other-centeredness with an other-centeredness that transforms the way I see the world, the way I relate to other people, and in which I will then lose myself. I let go of my self-consciousness, my ego, separateness, and I find myself then in a union with what I am paying attention to. So we could almost say in the Christian scriptures, it says God is love. We could almost say, God is attention. God is pure attention, universal transformative attention that never becomes distracted uh, as of course we do. And that's why I, I wanted to give this, this um, little title, what is the um, purpose or does meditation make a difference? Um, to this just to conclude my, my short contribution. Does meditation make a difference? It does make a difference because it is the pure work of attention. And no one meditates without discovering that it changes you. It changes the person who meditates. And if it changes you, it is going to change the whole field of your life, your relationships at home, your intimate relationships, your work relationships, and your sense of connection uh, with people you've never met, but who you know are part of your family, connected to you in that non-dual world of the spirit. So I think meditation is an answer. It's not a simplistic answer, you know, just meditate and all our problems will be solved. That would be nice. I've been meditating a long time. It hasn't solved all my problems. Um, but it does give you a quite different approach to the problems that we have to deal with, the problems that arise out of duality and division, the problems that we have to learn to control even if we can't solve them. So meditation, by giving us this experience of personal integration, personal reconciliation of the conflicts within ourselves and the opening of our mind and heart to what is beyond ourselves, it does make a difference, I think, to the world. And the reason I went to the U Ukraine actually was because we had an online event uh, and uh, a, lot, a lot of people came to it with our meditation groups in Ukraine. And our coordinators there are a young couple, Albert and Maria, who um, uh, are also our coordinators for, for Russia. And they manifested such a, an obvious serenity, a deep peace, and centeredness. And they, they said to me, we are in the middle of a war. And now 
is the time for us to speak of meditation. We should be speaking about it now, not just in the good times. And I thought, I felt very proud to, to have them in our community. And they taught us so much. Anyway, I went there for a few days and um, I, I could see the fruit of their years of practice. They're a young couple, but they've been really serious about their practice for many years and sharing it with others. And the fruits of that are just obvious. As the Dalai Lama says, you know, my religion is kindness. And if religion doesn't produce nice people, then forget it. Well, these are not just nice people. They are nice, but they are good people. And their goodness allows the many of those that they are serving and helping in this crisis in Ukraine, it allows others to keep their attention on the good. Because when things fall apart, when humanity does its worst, as we see what's happening in Ukraine, what happened in, in the concentration camp, then it's very easy for us to give up, to lose hope, and to despair of the human. And there are, there are voices in, in, the, in public discourse today that have really given up on the human. They're proposing that we just reinvent the human by you know, biogenetic genetic, uh, engineering. Or that we just surrender ourselves to the cyborg uh, technology that we've created. It's a surrender, it's a betrayal of this gift of our humanity. And why is this humanity so important? Well, there are many ways to express it, but a good Christian way of expressing it is this. God became human so that human beings might become God. That's our purpose, that's our destiny. And there's nothing uh, dualistic about that, and there's nothing partisan uh, about that. So, I just wanted to, to share those, those uh, brief thoughts with you. Um, does meditation make a difference? Let's try it. I mean, and I'm sure all of you are trying it. Meditation builds community. It builds a communion. Here at, um, uh, John, on this retreat that uh, we've been having here at Bonveau, uh, we, we built a labyrinth in the last few days. And the um, I, a labyrinth, which was found in all of the great cathedrals of Europe for, for hundreds of years, a labyrinth is a very ancient uh, spiritual symbol and a very important one for our time, I think. And the first thing and the last thing I say about it is that it is not a maze. A maze is a symbol of chaos. When you go into a maze, you get lost. And after a while, you begin to panic and you think, will I ever get out of this maze? It's frightening. It's dark. Is confusing. And the labyrinth, on the other hand, is universal. It's only one path. And you follow this path in a winding series of twists and turns, discovering that there is a symmetry to the labyrinth, to the journey you're making, the left and right hemispheres being integrated as you do it, and that all you have to do is to be simple condition of complete simplicity and paying it and pay attention to the path and it will take you to the center and meditation i would say is the transformation of that maze mind into the meaningful labyrinth of consciousness thank uh -huh. you maze mind labyrinth of consciousness thank you so much
for your very profound presentation.